right? So before we get started and I present to you our guest for today, uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background about the logic of you know, this year's theme, right? So the theme of the festival this year is basically identity, right? So why identity? Well, you know, when I look around myself uh, locally, provincially, nationally, uh, internationally or globally, there are certain things that I pick up or I notice trends, patterns, right? So one of them is uh, rises in populism. Uh, another one is a rise in identity politics. Uh, then we have all kinds of concerns, crises, violence, social inequity for certain groupings, women, uh, indigenous groups, uh, ethnocultural, visible minority groups, uh, uh, indigenous peoples, uh, LGBTQ2 uh, plus communities. Uh, if we add to that uh, a couple of bigger ones, the pandemic that we're not completely out of yet, we, we can also add uh, the major one for the generation uh, or uh, you know, for all of us in terms of environmental crises. Uh, identity can link to all of these things, right? Because identity can be polarizing, but it can also be unifying. It's one of those things that can be either or, or in some instances, both, right? So unfortunately, though, the trend seems to be for people to instrumentalize or use identity to polarize, divide, as opposed to trying to harness possibly uh, some of its unifying uh, capacities. So I thought it would be time to take pause, reflect, and see if we can move in the other direction to get back to trying to harness uh, the uh, ident identity's positive aspects, right? Uh, so, you know, with that being said, you know, today is a little bit of a treat for me because the person I'm about to introduce to you guys is not only, you know, a guest and a speaker and somebody whom I respect very much, but who's become over the years a friend because he uh, was my PhD thesis supervisor, right? He's coming to us uh, directly from Glasgow in Scotland, right? And, uh, you know, Peter's become uh, over the years a, a very good friend, right? So the person I'm going to introduce you to is Peter Jackson, right? And he's a, a, a professor at the University of Glasgow. Uh, he's a historian. Uh, I don't want to go through uh, accolades or publica uh, publications because we'll be here uh, for a little while, but uh, I'm really, really happy and glad that uh, Peter has accepted uh, to present for us uh, about the topic that uh, he's going to present. So I'm going to turn things over to him. Once he's done his bit, then I'm going to open the floor to you guys to ask him any questions that you might have on the basis of his presentation. Right, Peter? All yours. Thanks very much, Aaron. Thank you very much for the invitation to come. I wish I was there in person because Montreal is one of my absolute favorite cities in the world. And as Aaron mentioned, he and I are good friends. Uh, the only thing I would add to what he said about our relationship is that I was also his basketball coach, which he forgot to mention, which is an important uh, uh, item on my, on my, on my CV. But I'm very pleased to be, be have, have a chance to, to speak to you all today. Uh, I'm now going to start to share my screen. This is often an adventure for me, but uh, I will try, I'll, I'll try to do this now. And let's see how we, how we get on. Okay. Uh, oh, the, there we go. This is the title of my talk. Now, it may not be the case in, that you're, you may not be aware of this in, in Quebec, in Montreal, but certainly here, the case of Scotland possibly leaving the United Kingdom is often compared, especially uh, by, by uh, commentators in England, that is south of the border where I am in Scotland, uh, to the case of Quebec possibly or not leaving Canada and becoming its own sovereign nation. And so while this may not be something on the radar in Quebec, it is interesting. And there are some parallels between the Quebecois and Scottish cases, but there are also some important differences which we might be able to discuss, I hope, in question and answer. But the topic is Brexit. Britain's 
vote to leave the United Kingdom and the strains that it's put on the United Kingdom as a whole, and in particular, the boost that it has undeniably given to Scottish nationalism. But because I'm an historian, we're going to go back in time, but the focus is going to be two referendums, one on Scottish independence in 18, on the 18th of September 2014, and the second on the United Kingdom's presence or not in the European Union of the 23rd of June, and I suppose the possibility of another referendum where Scotland might leave the United Kingdom. But first it's important, I think, to define the things we're going to be talking about. And so I wanna begin by, by, I suppose, something which might seem obvious to many of you, but actually is less straightforward than you might think. And that is what is the United Kingdom? Because there's a difference between Great Britain or Britain on the one hand and the United Kingdom on the other. Great Britain is England, Wales, and Scotland. The United Kingdom is England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And so there are four separate nations that make up the United Kingdom. The only one of these nations that's not represented on the, uh, uh, the Union Jack, the UK flag is of course Wales, because its flag is white and green with a dragon on it. Uh, but otherwise, uh, the, the UK flag is actually represents mainly England and Scotland. Uh, I suppose we could also begin by defining what the European Union is. Now, many of you will know quite a lot about the European Union. It is two things. It is a political project and has been since the Treaty of Rome in 1957 proclaimed the, the intention to move towards ever closer union, and that is political union. And then there's also the single market, which was created in the 1990s and is, of course, the uh, successor to the European uh, Economic Community, which was launched in the late 1950s from the Treaty of Rome. Now, the single market now, the European single market, is an economic powerhouse comprising a uh, market of 450 million consumers, and that's after the United Kingdom has left. It was over half a billion before the United Kingdom left. And what's really important to understand is that the single market, as opposed to the political project, okay, is, is uh, actually a legal entity. It's a huge complex of international public law. That's what holds it together. And for anyone who knows anything about international trade negotiations, a common misunderstanding is that they're mainly about uh, tariffs and they're not at all about tariffs. They're about regulations and bringing regulations into, into line with each other. And the single market is really a huge mass of regulatory laws that are kind of put in law th through uh, uh, laws enacted by the European Commission, which sits in Brussels, and then by all of the member states who have the right to ratify them. Historically, the United Kingdom, which joined the European Union in 1973, has been far more comfortable with the economic existence or economic aspects of the European Union, the single market aspects, than it has been with the political project. And this is, I think, something where I, this is one area where I think identity is very important. Great Britain uh, has never, has, has, has an, is at least, has a, a sense that since it constituted itself with the Act of Union in 1707, uh, has, has yet to lose a war on the European continent and was victorious in both world wars while all of the other countries in Europe lost either one or both world wars. And there is a tendency amongst some uh, political opinion in Great Britain to see the European Union as a kind of a club of defeated nations, which was something very distinct from the United Kingdom. And therefore there was a lot of unease, particularly in England, about signing up to the political project of the European Union. Now, the, year, the United Kingdom as a union, which it is a union, uh, is an unequal union. 
Scotland has about five and a half, not quite million uh, citizens in its population. Wales, about 3.2 million now. Northern Ireland, around 1.8, 1.9 million. And of course, England is by far the largest member of the United Kingdom with 55 and a half to 56 million uh, uh, people living in England. And therefore, England has always dominated the Union. And this has always been, to a greater or lesser extent, a source of some unease amongst the other members of the United Kingdom. Now, to, to focus on England and Scotland for a moment, it's very important to, to uh, understand that Scotland, up until 1707, was a distinct kingdom of its own, with its own parliament, uh, its own national interests, its own army, et cetera, et cetera. It did share, at times, a, a uh, monarch with England, but not, not always. Uh, and it entered the union with England in 1707 as a distinct and independent nation, independent nation. In theory, at least, the union of 1707 was a union between equals. This is the act of union. Uh, Scotland joined for two reasons, really. First, because it found itself in a position of acute financial weakness at the opening of the 18th century. And secondly, it joined to have access to the, to the lucrative markets being, being secured as a result of the growth of the English empire. And in many ways, uh, the act of union was driven by empire. And empire was the central, uh, I suppose, dynamic, a central feature, a central unifying force in the emergence of what's often known as a British identity. And Scottish and Welsh and Northern Irish, but especially Scottish, uh, you know, um, elites, whether aristocrats or members of the upper bourgeoisie, all, all tended to have as, at least one family member playing a senior role in administering the empire. The Scots were in many ways the great administrators of the British Empire. And that's why if you walk down the street in downtown Montreal or Ottawa or Toronto, you'll see so many streets named after Scottish imperial administrators. The, the emergence of a British identity was further, I think, consolidated by the experience of the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, where Great Britain seemed at one point to be under threat of being extinguished by the rising tide of nationalism stimulated by the French Revolution and uh, the, the, the uh, creation of a French empire under Napoleon between 1800, roughly 1799, 1800 and 1815. Another important element in the making of a British identity was the impact of the industrial revolution uh, over the course of the, which happened in waves, but a very important wave was the first half, was during the first half of the 19th, of the, of the 19th century, that is the 1800s, Two world wars uh, were also profoundly important in the shaping of what's called a British identity. And if any of you are interested in this, uh, a great book to look at this would, is, is by David Edgerton. I put the title up there, The Rise and Fall of the British Nation, which he argues really after 1945 reached its high water mark. Between 1945 and the late 1980s was the high water mark of British nationhood and British identity. And some of the things that were important in this were the, you know, the fact that the Industrial Revolution transformed much of the United Kingdom in the same ways. There was also during the experience of the two world wars and the triumph over Nazi Germany and Imperial Germany before that, also the rise of the British welfare state and the National Health Service, which is very important, particularly, I think, in Scotland. Towards the end of the 1980s, however, this, this British identity began to, to come apart at the seams. But before then, Scotland, it's fair to say, did very well out of the empire. It became a world leader 
in heavy industry, and especially in shipbuilding, it became the workshop of the British Empire, and in fact, was often called the second city of the British Empire. Uh, it also became very importantly a stronghold of organized labor and trade union politics. And of course, the birth of the Labour Party had a strong, a very strong Scottish dimension to it. Keir Hardy, uh, the first leader of the Labour Party, was, as many of you may know, many of you may not know, a Scot. And so Scotland played a full role in the emergence of the Brit Great Britain as a nation. Uh, heavy industry was important. Uh, and uh, also, I think, the nature of industrial growth in Scotland made uh, trade union labor and trade union politics very important. At one point, this is something not many people know, around about 1914, uh, more than one in every four ships floating anywhere on the oceans of the world were made right here where I am now in Glasgow on the Clyde River and the great shipyards, uh, the, the greatest shipyards in the world, which were here and have all been since dismantled. And that's the next part of the story I want to tell you. Uh, retreat from empire did undermine one source of common identity in the British Isles. Uh, also important, however, was the decline of heavy industry over the course of the 1970s and 1980s. The Upper Clyde Shipbuilding Consortium, by far the largest and most powerful uh, uh, consortium of its kind in the world, uh, began, well, it was finalized in 1972. And this is part of a general dec dec decline of British Scottish, of Scottish rather, and British steel, coal, and heavy industry manufacturing, and a fragmenting of uh, the labor heartlands uh, and the emergence, uh, which coincided with the emergence in the late 1970s, 1979, of a conservative government in uh, Westminster, led by Margaret Thatcher, who made it one of her priorities to drag uh, Great Britain as a society out of its industrial period and into its post-industrial period. Uh, and that meant breaking unions, closing down coal mines, being okay with the uh, demise of heavy industry. And this in turn led to a revival of Scottish politics and eventually the rise of Scottish nationalism because of course the Thatcherite revolution, the right-wing conservative politics, uh, radical uh, conservative politics under Margaret Thatcher were perceived as a threat in Scotland to the post-1945 settlement, the welfare state uh, and Scotland's role in that settlement. And Thatcher's conservatives, however, uh, although they, they secured decisive majorities in England, they were just as decisively rejected in Scotland. And the, the Scottish the Conservative Party, which had been a force in Scotland right throughout all, all the way up to the 1970s, began to lose ground steadily. The poll tax, which is a Thatcherite project, was first imposed in Scotland. It was a tax where based on the idea that all adults paid the same regardless of their income. Uh, it wasn't to replace the, 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 uh, the, uh, the British income tax, but instead to supplement it. Thatcher refused to consider any kind of devolutionary settlement to give Scotland more power. And instead, uh, the Tory party's centralizing tendencies uh, were given free reign. Uh, and at the same time, they were perceived in Scotland as an interference in Tory rule. And this is one of the things that I think it's important to remember is that the union the, of the United Kingdom has always worked best when it wasn't imposed. When in fact, uh, the distinctness of Scottish, Welsh and Irish societies was respected. And of course, the end result of this in 1987, after 18 years of Tory rule in Westminster under, under Margaret Thatcher, there were no conservative MPs left in Scotland at all. Margaret Thatcher, as you may know, uh, uh, gave way in 1997 to new Labour under Tony Blair, Prime Minister Tony Blair. And But the P Thatcher period, if you like, is very interesting in the emergence of a Scottish politics and a Scottish political identity, because in 1979, the Scottish electorate, when it was asked, that's the year that Margaret Thatcher uh, uh, came to power, 
uh, the Scottish electorate was asked whether or not it uh, was keen on having an elected assembly of its own to manage certain, a certain number of Scottish affairs. In 1979, they gave very lukewarm support to this, barely over 50%, which less, with, with, with less than 60% of the electorate turning out, and therefore the idea uh, was left aside. In 1997, however, by the time the, the Tories were voted out uh, across the United Kingdom, Scots voted three to one in favor of establishing a national parliament as part of a new devolved settlement. And the key areas where Scotland under this new settlement was given responsibility for managing its own affairs were education and health. Education and health. The Scottish parliament was recreated and invested in 1999 for the first time since 1707 when it had voted for its own uh, demise. Now the idea, I think the strategy behind the Blair Labour government in granting greater devolution and granting a Scottish parliament was that it would lance the boil, if you like, of Scottish national, uh, national sentiment, that should be sentiment there, and support for independence. Gordon Brown, the Chancellor of the Exchequer and Tony Blair's right-hand man was a Scot. Tony Blair himself was educated in Scotland in, 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 in a private school in Edinburgh. But of course, uh, granting a national parliament had the opposite effect. It provided instead a route to political power for the Scottish National Party, which had been formed in the 1950s, but had been a marginal presence in Scottish politics right through to the mid to late 1990s. By 2007, however, the Scottish National Party became the largest party in the new Scottish Parliament, which was of course organized not along the first past to post systems that we use in Canada and also in Great Britain, but instead uh, 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 organized along proportional representation. And what that means is that you're given the number of parties, not according to uh, uh, kind of winner takes all in each riding competition, but instead the proportion of the electorate that votes for you determines the proportion of the party of the deputies, or in this case, the members of the Scottish Parliament that are allowed that that that, that, that are allotted within the Parliament and within the Scottish Parliament. And in, in 2007, in 2015, in 2021, the Scottish National Party gained uh, the most seats in the national in, in the Scottish Parliament. In 2011, they actually gained a majority, and this is really was a spectacular victory for the SNP because of course, proportional rep representation systems are designed to prevent the uh, 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 majorities, uh, strong majorities, especially in a, par in a given parliament. Now, because the, these, these SNP won uh, an overall majority in 2011, it was able to enact its election pledge of a referendum on whether or not Scotland should be an independent country. This is a manifesto pledge, which was accepted by the conservative government in Westminster, which was elected in 2010. And the Tories thought this wasn't a great risk because at the time, uh, support for independence was polling at between 25 and 33% of the electorate. However, however, in the campaign, I was up here for that campaign, and Ara was back in Canada at the time. Uh, it was very interesting because the Yes campaign, the, the, the campaign for independence, uh, campaigned on a very positive strategy. Yes being obviously more positive than no. Uh, and the argument was really that Scotland wasn't necessarily a better country than anywhere else, but that it was, in fact, as good a nation as anywhere else and deserved the right to, to have its own uh, national status, its own parliament, and to govern its own affairs. Now, the strategy for no, the uh, against independence, was, it's fair to say, almost unremittingly negative. It just predicted national uh, catastrophe if Scotland was to vote no. One of the key arguments was Scotland wouldn't be able to have its own currency because the British, would the, the rest of the United Kingdom would refuse to share the British pound sterling. And the result was 45% yes, 
against 55%? No, but it was much closer than anyone in London, in Westminster, imagined when they agreed to the referendum in 2012. Now, after the referendum, uh, uh, there was a really interesting, in some ways, reordering of British, of English politics. And in fact, one of the interesting impacts of the referendum for Scottish independence was that it stimulated a reaction and, or in turn, and which manifested itself in the rise of nationalism in England. Uh, and the day after the referendum was announced, even though uh, you know, the Tories and Labour had campaigned together on a better together platform in opposing independence and had made a vow that Scotland would be given more of a say in governing its own affairs, the day after the referendum was announced, David Cameron, who was prime minister at the time, uh, stepped up to that podium in front of number 10 Downing Street in, in Westminster in central London and said that the voice of England must also be heard. And he was responding, in fact, to the rise of English nationalism because there was a sense within mainstream, I suppose, English nationalism that too much power was going towards Scotland, too much funding was going towards Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland at the expense of the English. And in particular, there was unhappiness that Scottish uh, members of parliament could vote on laws affecting England, but English members of parliament could not be, were not given a vote in the Scottish parliament, the Northern Irish Assembly or the Welsh Assembly. Uh, and this is the start of a revolution in some ways in British politics and in English politics, which was in many ways, I think, characterized most profoundly by the rise of an English nationalism in response to these other nationalisms. In the 2015 UK general election, uh, the Labour, which had campaigned with the Tories, was all but destroyed. It lost 40 of its 41 seats. And Scotland, which had been up until then a massive stronghold for the Labour Party within the United Kingdom, uh, instead saw Labour, the Labour Party all but destroyed. And in the SNP became by far the most popular party in government. This wasn't necessarily a real threat, at least an immediate threat to the future of the United Kingdom. Uh, that I think happened with the EU referendum, which was driven by the Conservative Party's sensitivity to English nationalism, and in particular to the fact that it was losing votes to English nationalist parties, and particularly the United Kingdom Independence Party, UKIP. And this is why the Tory government under David Cameron, after it won the election in 2015, helped not least by the destruction of labor in Scotland, uh, agreed to have a referendum on the EU. It's fair to say that I don't think anyone expected the United Kingdom to leave the EU because no one understood the strength of feeling in, especially in England uh, and the rise of English nationalism. England revolted to leave the United European Union by 53.4% to 46.7%. Scotland, however, voted to remain 62% to 38%. The Welsh voted to leave by 52% to 47.5%. The Northern Ir Irish voted to remain by 55.8% to 63.2%, if my math is right. Interestingly, however, London was the strongest, was, was, the, was the most powerful stronghold of Remain in the United Kingdom besides Scotland. 59.9% .9 of people in London voted to remain in the European Union. But overall, because uh, that England is by far the most popular populous country, and because the Welsh also voted to leave, U the UK left the European Union. And what this has done really is driven a kind of a fracture right through British politics. It's divided now between leave and remain. And I can there's some facts and figures there, 74% of leave people who voted to leave in England and Wales, and 59% of the people who voted to leave in Scotland felt that the breakup of the United Kingdom was worth it in order to have Brexit, to take back control. Similarly, a uh, similar proportion of remain, proportions of Remain voters believed, in the, and this is in polling that was done in the aftermath 
of the EU referendum, that the break breakup of the union was a price worth paying to stay in the United Kingdom. And this means in some ways that Scottish support for Scottish independence has been given a massive boost by Brexit. And there is an argument, this is the way now I want to talk about Scottish national identity because it's represented in many different ways, depending on who you speak to. For many people, you know, uh, inc me included, uh, uh, you know, many people who are a little kind of wary of nationalist politics, because for me, nationalism is always who's in, who's out. And it's always about identifying yourself against who you're not, against someone else. And that's a real problem. Now, advocates of Scottish nationalism get around this. And I, I have to say, I'm persuaded by the argument overall that Scottish nationalism is far more than, than the case in, in, in many other cases, is civic rather than ethnic. It's not about div div identifying yourself against different ethnic groups. It's instead about belonging to a distinct society. And that's a word that will reverberate, I think, in um, people of, among people of a certain age in Canada. And now, the criti critics of Scottish nationalism say that it's fundamentally anti-English, and they like to put pictures up of Mel Gibson and Braveheart and sticking it to the English uh, through most of, 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 of that film. Others say, well, it's pro-Scottish, it's not anti-English, and others say it's actually defined, in interestingly, by a strong pro-European current. And the fact is that many, if not most, Scots, and I'm married to a Scot and and uh, have two Scottish children uh, have multiple identities. And they've always been quite comfortable being either Scottish and British, Scottish and European, and overlaying all those are class identities, generational identities, sexual identities, gender identities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, the difficult question is, however, whether a Scottish national identity, political identity, can sit any longer alongside uh, a British identity. And that's a tricky one. Here are some figures, depending on when you ask the question and how you ask it and who you ask it, uh, uh, and who you ask it to, uh, you know, different, di different results. Uh, different polling gives different results. Here's a polling by uh, The Guardian, which is a paper based in London, which argues that support for staying in the United Kingdom among Scottish people uh, is greater by 2% than leaving. That's still a very narrow majority. And this is another poll, recent poll by uh, uh, The National, which is a, an independent supporting paper in Scotland, which puts support for independence at 54% versus 46% uh, in favor of staying in the United Kingdom. One of the very interesting aspects of uh, support for independence or, and, and opposition to independence is it's heavily weighted by generations. It's in, in fact, you know, if you're on, if you're in the age of 16 to 24 and the voting age here is 16, okay, you're uh, much, much more likely to support independence than you are if you're over 65. And the age groups 35 to 44, that's an interesting breakdown. You know, a lot more people between the ages of 25 and 34 are likely to say they don't know. Whereas when people are younger, overall, they tend to support uh, independence. And this is very important because in some ways, some people argue that the SNP and supporters of Scottish independence don't have to do much. They can just wait and let demographics take care of the question for them and that the older generations that support independence as they die off will leave uh, support for Scottish independence uh, in a much stronger position and therefore, you know, kind of guarantee uh, victory. I'm not sure that's going to happen. And it's not even possible to say for sure whether or not there will be another referendum, because at the moment, at least, the British government under Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who's probably even more unpopular than Margaret Thatcher in Scotland, uh, is saying no. And they, they won't agree to another referendum, that the vote happened in 2014. It was supposed to be once in a generation. And that was that. 
whereas the Scottish National Party, the Scottish government under Nicola Sturgeon, argues that there was a clause in uh, the SNP's acceptance of the results in 2014, which said that unless there was substantial material change to the conditions of the union, and they argue, and it's hard to disagree with them on this score, that Brexit is a substantial material change. And they argue that, in fact, Scotland was dragged out of the European Union against its will. And in the negotiations under which the UK left, the Scots argued again and again and again, either to have some kind of special status in order to remain within the European common market, or that the whole UK should stay within the, Euro the, the European common market. Uh, these, these arguments were ignored uh, one after another by both Boris Johnson and his predecessor, Theresa May. And the United Kingdom has left the European Union, it's left the common market. It's having quite a lot of difficulty now economically as a result, because if you're in a union, uh, especially an economic union, a very close economic union, the kinds of ties it creates, the kind of links, the kind of uh, 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 relationships are very difficult to break off all at once. And as a result, we're at a bit of a standoff. But one thing is clear that the more that the, the conservative government in Westminster refuses to have a referendum, in fact, the greater support grow, the more support grows for independence in Scotland. Okay? Because of course, it's that old rule is the union works best when it's not imposed. And refusing a referendum is basically asserting that the union, the union of 1707 is no longer a voluntary union and Scotland cannot determine whether or not it wishes to leave. And that is a very interesting position, dangerous position in my view for the UK government, the Westminster government to adopt. And with that, I'll leave things and look forward hopefully to answering some of your questions. Thank you, Peter. Very interesting. Definitely parallels can be drawn, even if the situation is not the same completely. Uh, I'm going to be asking people in the room to raise your hands. Whoever has questions, it takes one. You know, let's break the ice. Somebody's got to have some type of question. Um, I was just wondering if the reason why. Um, Scotland wants to become independent is to immediately join the EU again, or at least have that privilege? That's Option, just an excellent question. Thank you. Uh, but it's a hard one to answer because, of course, not everyone in Scotland thinks the same way. Not everyone who supports independence supports it for the same reasons. What I would say, however, is it's very clear to me anyway that uh, if support for independence has actually tipped the scales at the moment, and I think it probably has, it's because many people who voted no in 2014 because they were uncomfortable with Scottish nationalism and they wanted to belong to something bigger were put off by the politics of Brexit and the idea that the United Kingdom was leaving a large political and economic union to go out on its own. And in fact, many, many people who feel this way see this decision to leave the EU as being driven by English nationalism. And so in fact, for many, uh, it's an anti-nationalist position, an anti-English nationalist position or British nationalist position, which is driving support toward, uh, uh, driving them towards support for independence. And, and this is important it also just on, on a basic level, you know, uh, at a stroke at, in January of this year, when the UK officially left the EU, all British citizens lost the right to live and work in Europe without having any restrictions placed on them at all. This, this was a principle of freedom of movement, which is very important. It's one of the four freedoms underpinning the European Union political and economic movement. And as a result, my, my children won't have the right to go and work, live and work, and maybe, you know, who knows, fall in love, whatever, any, in other parts of the European Union, the way 
that their predecessors did. And this is, I think, something which is also uh, a really important factor driving support for independence. It's an anti-Brexit support. And uh, aligned to that are the reasons why many others voted to leave the United Kingdom in 2014, uh, which have to do with the fact that there is a sense that Scottish and English societies are very different. And that Scotland is much more of an egalitarian society uh, and, and uh, is far more likely to uh, support uh, the welfare state, uh, free education, Scottish students don't pay, Scottish university students don't pay tuition, uh, whereas in, in, in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, they do. And other things that the Scottish values are different. And I'm not sure that's entirely true, but certainly there is that perception. I hope that answers your question, at least in part. It's a hard one to answer, but it's an excellent question. Well, there's one that follows on the heel from the stream, actually, which is uh, related or similar, right? So somebody's asking in cyberspace, so is Scottish nationalism mostly driven by a desire to remain in the European Union? Um, I wouldn't say that that's the only thing driving it. I think that's driven a lot of the support that it's gained recently. And uh, 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 there are a lot of people who voted no in 2014 who would at least consider voting yes now because they see two things. They see that uh, you know, they've lost uh, rights that they considered important when the UK left the European Union, but they also see that in fact, what Scotland wants doesn't matter in the wider politics of the United Kingdom. And no matter what happens, Scotland can vote uh, against uh, conservative governments till it's blue in the face and it's done so repeatedly, but it usually gets governments it didn't vote for. And it usually has to deal with politics it didn't support. This is the argument of the, of, uh, the kind of, 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 of pro-independence people in, in Scotland. And for many, it's becoming a little more difficult to ignore or dismiss. I hope that that answers the question. It's a really good one. All right. Well, uh, another person is asking. I mean, I found that interesting too, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, the graph chart that you put that said the 18 to 24 category uh, is most likely to vote yes to separating, right? So the person and, is and asking. And 34 why. To, to, to 47, I think, as well. Something like that. I mean, it's really, yeah. that's another one's even yeah. stronger. You know, yeah. So the the person specifically asking why is it that you think, in your opinion, that you know uh, that younger age bracket or group is more, uh, you know, has more of a disposition to vote for separation than the older the older groupings. Well, in a way, you know, what what's very interesting about that is it in some ways mirrors voting patterns for pro and against leaving the European Union. If you're older in, across the United Kingdom, you're far more likely to have voted for Brexit, unless you're really old. And interestingly, at about 82, 83, uh, the balance tips and most people over the age of 82, 83 voted to remain in the European Union. And that was, I suppose, the generation of the Second World War and immediately afterward. Whereas the baby boomers, and I'm not a baby boomer, but I just missed being a baby boomer, they voted up very decisively to leave the European Union and uh, in Scotland, it's reversed. If, if you're you know, that generation of baby boomers, you're far more likely to be a supporter of the union. You've grown up within the United Kingdom. You've ha had for many years a British identity alongside or not your Scottish identity. And I think that that is uh, decisive in shaping the votes of older people. Also, I think, However, older people, people you know, uh, over the age of 55 or so tend to be more, more cautious. And leaving the European Union, or leaving the United Kingdom rather, leaving the European Union as well, but leaving the United Kingdom was a, is a real financial risk because it's still to this day, 65% of Scottish trade is with England as opposed to the European Union. And there is a sense that leaving the United Kingdom 
would present the, United, uh, the Scots with such formidable economic hardships that it just wouldn't be worth it. Whereas younger people, and I don't want to be to generalize too much, but younger people tend to be a little more optimistic, tend to be a little more self-confident, I suppose, in some ways, and to think that things will, are more likely to work out in the end. And I think there is a lot of that. And people who argue that, you know, it's not the case necessarily that once older supporters of the union die off, the, remain, the, the people who are left will vote to leave the, to leave the United Kingdom and have Scotland as an independent country. That may not be true because they may become more cautious as they get older, who knows? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think it's that simple, but uh, there certainly is this really striking gap between uh, you know, the attractiveness of independence for younger Scots uh, as opposed to the caution and, and uh, reluctance of older Scots. It's very interesting. It's an excellent question too. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Okay, anybody in the room have any questions, right? Or if there's anybody out there also on uh, the webinar that doesn't, that does, you know, please feel free to type it out. In the meantime, you know, Peter, I mean, I don't know, this is more of an observation or a comment, but, you know, I'd like to pick your brain on my observation or comment, I guess, you know, is... I was, you know, taking, you know me, right? So uh, the exclusionary, inclusionary nature and how, you know, throughout sort of that uh, historical tracing that you did, right? Uh, things shifted on the basis of, you know, what approach uh, each side took in terms of, you know, imposition versus inclusion and more voluntary approaches, mm. right? And what type of impact that actually had you know, in terms of the anticipated result versus the actual effect and what that might say about, you know, all of this, you know, uh, inclusionary and exclusionary, uh, you know, framework and nationalism. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think what you're implying there is something I'm very sympathetic to myself, this, this idea that, you know, building communities and building societies they're they're on more sure footing if they are uh, inclusion inclusive rather than exclusive, and that you know the politics of of uh, the United Kingdom since Brexit have been characterized by really intense and deep divisions, as I tried to show in some of the the figures that I the polling figures I I provided to all of you, and the strategy the political strategy of the uh, conservatives in the last election was, I think, motivated by this idea that we want to make sure we capture the vote, the, the, the votes of everyone who voted for Brexit. And so they doubled down on Brexit. They promised a hard Brexit. And uh, they doubled down on, on this idea of a British and even an English identity as being central and that Britain could go on its own. It would be fine on its own. You know, uh, it had, you know, created the greatest empire the world has ever seen. Therefore, you know, there was no reason to worry about the future. And in many ways, they knew that this would alienate people who voted for against Brexit and who voted to remain in the EU. But they were willing to take that 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 risk because they felt that even that vote would be divided, and that many people who voted to remain in the EU would either vote for the SNP or the Lib Dems or Labour, while if you voted for Brexit, then you were definitely going to vote for the Tories. And so that kind of divisive, almost populist politics has been a distinct feature of British United Kingdom political discourse lately. And it's not inclusive, it's divisive. And the, the politics, no matter how much Boris Johnson claims he loves Scotland or whatever, you know, or, or he's, he, he, he loves the Union, he owes his political status to Brexit and to the impact of Brexit on political opinion in the United Kingdom. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to mention to all of you, by the way, that, you know, obviously you're not hearing a Scottish accent nor a British accent. Peter is actually Canadian. <laughs> 
right? He settled in the UK because he went to do his PhD uh, there and never came back, right? Went to play some basketball, I think, uh, there as well. So, you know, for I'm saying this, Peter, because the next question on the board, you know, is something that you speak to for sure, right? Uh, you know, uh, would you be able to elaborate on the similarities and differences w with Quebec independence or Quebec independence movements uh, uh, and, uh, and Scottish? Mm. Well, uh, this is a tricky one for me because I'm not Scottish and I'm not Quebecois. And so I'll be evaluating both from the outside, which is a good thing and a bad thing in some ways. However, uh, I can tell you how Scots represent themselves in relation to Quebecois nationalism. They would argue that rather than being based on ethnicity or language, Scottish nationalism is more of a civic nationalism. It's about a sense of belonging to a community and to a society which is distinct, as opposed to belonging to a linguistic community, you know, the French versus English, or, you know, this idea that in some ways ethnicity is an important dimension of Quebecois nationalism, which I'm not sure has always been the case. I think it's probably less so now than it was back in 1995 when the, you know, the, the very close referendum between uh, those who, you know, over the question of whether or not Quebec should remain part of Canada. You know, I don't trust it. I don't trust nationalist movements when they try and define themselves because, you know, they have an interest politically in representing themselves as being cuddly and, and uh, positive and inclusive. And that may not always be the case. What I would say in the Scottish case is that many people, former Europeans who've come to the United Kingdom and who've come to Scotland, more, far more people have stayed in Scotland and not gone home after the EU referendum as opposed to other parts of the United Kingdom. And there is, I think, an ease within the Scottish nationalist movement, at least within the majority of Scottish nationalists, to have a European identity sit alongside a Scottish identity. Whereas that same ease doesn't really exist, I think, in the majority of people who would identify themselves first as English and then as British. And uh, they don't like to think of themselves as English and European, they might think of themselves as English than British, but but less so uh, English and European, obviously, because, in, you know, the, the, the vote to leave the EU was so much stronger in England than it was anywhere else. And so there is a sense that, you know, Scottish identity is different, but there are people and, you know, they're there, you, 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 you encounter them if you live in Scotland that drive around with the Scottish flag, you know, the saltire, the St. Andrew's cross, the, the white cross on a diagonal cross on a, on a blue background, uh, who are anti-English. There is that, there are people in Scotland whose anti-Englishness is important to their Scottish identity. Overall, however, I don't think it's as important a feature as say, you know, uh, anti-Englishness in, anti-Europeanness in English nationalism. And I just don't know what's going on with Quebecois nationalism at the moment. It's a question I would like to put to any of you if we ever have a chance to chat. It, to what extent is Quebecois nationalism now uh, anti-Anglophone? Uh, I, I just, I have no idea. I have no idea. That was there also in 1995. There was a sense of, you know, being pro-Quebec was being an, against uh, being dominated by an Anglophone culture. And I expect there's some of that still there. But, you know, uh, I, I'm not, I, I, I would like to put that question to you, Bruce Norton. I can see your picture here on the screen, but I can't actually see you. That's a question I'd like to ask people in Quebec, you know, how, how anti-Anglophone is Quebecois nationalism? There is that dimension in Scotland, in Scottish nationalism, no question. But I think 
I am persuaded that this kind of civic identity is also very important, this kind of inclusiveness. You know, in Glasgow, a few weeks ago, the Home Office, which of course is a, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an area of British politics which is reserved to the Westminster government, representatives of the Home Office, which controls borders and, and passports and, and the right to, to remain in the United Kingdom, they turned up in a neighborhood in Glasgow, on the south side of Glasgow, not far from where I live, intending to deport two Syrian refugees. And the whole neighborhood turned out and boxed in the, uh, the van which the Home Office people had brought to load up the Syrian refugees, to, load, to take them off, to deport them back to Syria. And they refused to let it leave the street. And there, by the end, there were about 6,000 people from all over Glasgow screaming, these people are our neighbors, you can't take them away. And that is, I think, an expression of what anyway some Scottish nationals would say is a more civic identity, this idea that, you know, it's not about the blood that throws, flows in your veins. It's not about the language that you speak. There is Gaelic, and it's called Gaelic in Scotland. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a language, it's more or less the same language as spoken in Ireland, which is called Irish but it's not an important element within the kind of nationalist politics because it's only about, I, I hope I'm not wrong here, about five to 6% of Scots that speak Gaelic. Whereas in Quebec, of course, the lang politics of language are very different. And I'm sorry if I'm rambling, but it's another one of those hard questions. All right, thank you, Peter. Uh, yeah, we could talk about, you know, the differences and what fuels the question that you sort of redirected to us, right? But uh, I think that might be a discussion for another time or another day, right? But uh, we do have one more question, right? And somebody's asking an interesting question. Uh, do you think that uh, the UK's Brexit is irreversible? Or do you think that uh, one day there might be a reconsideration and the possibility of the UK sort of saying, oh, we might have made a mistake, or maybe the time is ripe again to try it uh, or join the union again, right? Like, I, I, I mean, I obviously, horizons and how long we're talking about uh, may factor into this question, but it's a pretty damn good question, I guess. It's an excellent question, and it's one I can, I think, provide an answer to. And it goes back, I think, to what Mark Twain once said. He said, it's far easier to fool someone than to convince them they've been fooled. In other words, uh, uh, there is a reluctance among people who vote for Brexit to accept that it's a disaster. I, I'm happy, I don't wanna give my opinion on Scottish independence, but I'm happy to say I opposed leaving the EU. I thought it was uh, uh, not an intelligent move, not a well-informed move, it went against uh, the informed opinion of the vast majority of experts on international trade, international politics. Uh, I thought it was going to be problematic and it's been more problematic than I thought it would be. So, you know, for me, it's pretty clear. And what's interesting though, is that even though now it's pretty, now polling, which happens daily, it is unequivocal that most great, most British people feel that Brexit was not a good idea. And if they had to vote again, you know, mo the majority now, partly because of demographics, uh, would vote to remain in the EU. But there is no enthusiasm for another referendum because British society, British society, British politics have been riven by the politics of Brexit. And uh, those divisions are gonna take a generation to heal. Neither of the big political parties in the United Kingdom Labour or the ruling Conservative Party uh, are, are going to agree to a referendum. And so I just don't see it, the prospect of it happening for at least 25 years, maybe, maybe 20 years, who knows, depending on how bad things get. But things are, I mean, things are not great at the moment. Fuel prices have skyrocketed. There are empty shelves all over, even up here in Scotland where it's better than in many parts of the rest of the UK. You know, uh, the, the truck drivers that brought produce across the United Kingdom, many of them were European Union citizens. They all left, many of them were forced to leave. And even though the government is offering them 
quite high pay and special benefits, uh, hardly any are, have agreed to come back. 27, in fact, out of at one time was about 67,000 European uh, truck drivers, we call them lorry drivers here, have actually answered the call of the British government to come back and drive. So, you know, the Brexit is already hammering the UK economy. It's having a discernible and palpable effect on economic life. But I don't think many people are happy to uh, agree to another divisive referendum. Whereas in Scotland, there is, I think, overall, clearly a majority for another referendum, even though it's not clear how that referendum would go. At the moment, it's probably between 50 and 52 percent in favor of independence. I think the calculation amongst the uh, uh, independence supporting gov Scottish government and, and, and the political movement supporting independence is that that's only going to grow as the damage caused by Brexit uh, becomes more and more apparent. So we'll see, but I don't see another a referendum to rejoin the EU anytime soon, if ever, because referenda by their very nature are divisive and they're not the best way to do politics, you know, because you can vote in a government, you can, and then vote it out in four or five years, uh, according to the rhythm of elections. But referendums, I mean, as we've seen from this one, are are far more problematic to reverse. Right. So, in effect, what we're saying is, not for not not, not for two decades at least, uh, unless things get really bad. Hmm. Yeah. Um, All right. Okay. Well, there's uh, time probably for one last one, uh, Peter. So uh, there's an interesting one. Does the division between younger and older generations on the issue of independence lead to fragmentation in Scottish identity? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think many Scots are comfortable having their British identity alongside their Scottish identity. But that's as, I, as the polling indicates, and as and anecdotally, you know, my own two children, for example, are both pretty enthusiastic about independence, interestingly, and voted, you know, that way in the recent Scottish elections because they're both over 16. Uh, so that could be the case. Certainly, if independence happens, it's going to be, I think, driven by the youth, youthful vote more than the older vote. And we'll just wait and watch the space. But I have to say, and I'm sorry to say this to everyone, I have to take my son to basketball practice. And so <laughs> I have to sign off now, but I've enjoyed so much speaking to you. I hope I get someday to meet some of you in person. And I just want to thank you very much for turning up either in person or online. And thank you, Ara, for the invitation. Well, Peter, I think it was a treat for everybody. It was a particular treat for, treat for me. Uh, so thank you very much for your acceptance of the invitation for giving us this uh, stimulating and informative talk, Peter. So Thanks, we'll be sir. in touch. Thanks again. All That's the best, everyone. Have a, Have a good day. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.